from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. So I'm a lucky person who gets to have as his major job promoting books and reading and literacy in libraries. And it's a, a program that was actually created by, we have a history group here, it was uh, created by Daniel Borston when he was Librarian of Congress in 1977. And the idea was the Library of Congress needed uh, an office dealing with the public to help promote books and reading and especially to reassure people that books and reading were important uh, in the face of the new technology of the time. And if you think back to 1977, that new technology, which uh, Dr. Borston viewed as something that needed combating, was television. And in the very beginning, uh, our major reading programs were related to uh, connecting television and making use of television and uh, subsequently all new technologies uh, to promote books and reading to which we have added literacy and libraries as the years have gone by and also we have been able to through this program this noontime lecture program uh, stress uh, the encouraging of the st historical study of books and reading and literacy and libraries uh, the Center for the Book quickly also has national networks. Uh, we have affiliates in each state that help us at the state and local level promote books and reading. And we have reading promotion partners, nonprofit organizations. We ourselves are a public-private uh, partnership with our programs, uh, including the National Book Festival, which is a major project, not just for us, but for the Library of Congress is an example of a uh, program that uh, requires uh, private funding, but we also is administered uh, by the Center for the Book and others. And this has been the pattern actually for our growth. Uh, the Center for the Book in recent years has expanded and are able to uh, work now with a new part of the library that promotes reading. We're the administrators of the Young Readers Center which is in the, Young Re in the uh, Jefferson Building. And also now we administer the library's poetry and literature program, which includes uh, the Poet Laureate, which is a major Library of Congress activity. But we're able to look at this in a central sort of way uh, to see what is needed uh, for outreach in this area on the part of the library. Uh, thank you for coming to Books and Beyond. Uh, it's a special program, but we started in 1997 uh, to mark books that have been recently published books that had some kind of special connection with the Library of Congress. And today is an example of a, co a, co a book uh, that not depended in part on the Library of Congress, but on other research libraries as well. But we have found that uh, by having this program, which today is co-sponsored with the European Division, that we are able to help advertise the library and its collections because these programs are all filmed uh, for the Library of Congress's website uh, and uh, are by themselves a uh, kind of a standing example of the value of libraries in some ways and the way that the Library of Congress is trying to reach out to talk about our collections and to let people know the value of our collections and the fact that, in fact, the Library of Congress is a major research institution that we feel doesn't quite get the publicity in many circles that we wanted to have. So the other part of the outreach is working hard to show off our wonderful Jefferson Building, which by itself is a historical monument and to work with the library in a docents program now for tours of the Jefferson Building, which is a, by itself, really a monument to books and reading. It opened in 1897, and it's filled with names of authors and aspiring Americans and a great show of American cultural 
uh, nationalism. Uh, we will have, uh, we'll hear from uh, our speaker, uh, Janet, and then we will have a chance for questions and answers. And because I would like you to remember to turn off all things electronic since we're being filmed and a chance to purchase the book and to uh, uh, get it signed uh, when the program is over. I also have a couple of handouts on the back table for you. Uh, one is the uh, latest, second of the latest Library of Congress magazine. We now have a magazine that appears six times a, a year, and it we got out just in time for this year's National Book Festival uh, in September, and it's dedicated to the joy of reading, but it does talk a lot about Center for the Book activities. And then I cannot uh, resist uh, also handing out uh, one of our products, our latest publication, which is an announcement about the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, which is a project funded by David Rubenstein, uh, who also is the generous donor to uh, half of the cost of the National Book Festival each year. But we're able to give awards to organizations around the country and to honor them for the work that they're doing in literacy. Um, and this is a five-year program for the Center for the Book and for the Library of Congress. But back to today, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Grant Harris, who is representing our co-sponsor, the European Division. And Grant uh, is the uh, head of the European Reading Room, and he will introduce our speaker and get us started. Let's give Grant a hand. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, John. I get to work in that Jefferson building that, that John Cole described. He's, he's actually authored a great work uh, about the Jefferson building, but I actually get to work there every day. And John, you're stuck over here in the Madison building, I believe, most yeah. of the time. That's enough, Grant, on that. All right. <laughs> I, all right. I, I am honored to introduce Dr. Janet Pulaski, uh, who has authored the book we'll be talking about today, Revolutions Without Borders, The Call to Liberty in the Atlantic world. Dr. Pulaski's title, if I can embarrass her giving the full title, is Presidential Professor, History Department, University of New Hampshire. Her earlier monographs published by university presses look largely at revolution and reform in Belgium, but also at 19th century labor reform in England. Today, Professor Pulaski will talk about her new book, Revolutions Without Borders, which is published by the prestigious Yale University Press. For it, she conducted much of her research here at the Library of Congress and especially in the Manuscript Divisions collections. This book has received praise by uh, critics, high praise. The New York Review of Books says this, Revolutions Without Borders does three things and does them well. It identifies and traces the fortunes of the most zealous promoters of the universal cry of liberty in the tumultuous 28 years after 1776. It demonstrates the importance of understanding the failures, the dead ends, the unrealized dreams, as well as the successes of past eras. And it contributes to our knowledge of Atlantic history, a solid and imaginative work of scholarship. The Economist magazine says this, instead of telling the usual heroic national story, she ranges wherever her wayfaring revolutionaries take her, to Paris and Washington, but also to Poland, Sierra Leone, and the Caribbean. Instead of confining herself to the deeds of valiant men, she also gives the stage to women and slaves. The result is a spectacle that conveys the thrill of the Enlightenment as well as the delirium of revolution. Uh, Janet Pulaski herself has written uh, about her book, of course, and she says uh, this, among many other things, to limit our history of the 18th century to the revolutions that prevailed, the American and French revolutions, is to forget that history is replete with dead ends, movements that surged and fizzled or were suppressed. 
uninformed, we cannot imagine the rich variety of revolutionary alternatives in our own world. Well, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Professor Koloski. Thank you for being here. Please give her a hand. Thank you, and you can tell, first of all, where I've been already today because I have my Library of Congress reading card in my pocket, so I've been. <laughs> Coming from, the, uh, coming from the reading room. So thank you very much. And it is wonderful to have a chance. Let's see if it actually, ah. Sorry, let's see if I can rearrange the, great. To have a chance to thank the Library of Congress, because this is really where I begin my research. And I'm back here now. I've just started my next book. And so where better to begin than in the main reading room from which I will then hopefully branch off to uh, archives or to the manuscripts and rare books. So what I want to talk about today are the interconnections, um, the interconnections between revolutions. And the interconnections of today's global society are inescapable. So why should we imagine that the Founding Fathers dreamed of freedom in isolation? The Atlantic world, I argue in my book, was never more tightly interconnected than it was at the end of the 18th century. From the Americas to Geneva, the Guinea Coast, the Andes, revolutions challenged the rule of tyrannical kings and of overreaching nobles. On plantations carved out of the Caribbean islands by enslaved labor, and among the slave-holding um, entrepreneurs of West Africa, the possibility of in insurrections lurked, terrifying overseers and government officials alike. Rumors coursed the Atlantic with the ocean currents. This, as one of my predecessors wrote, was a world in motion. Today, no one would dispute the obvious fact that ideas travel, revolutionary ideas above all. Protesters in a park in Rio de Janeiro declare, quote, we are the social network. A banner quotes Bertolt Brecht, quote, nothing should be impossible to change. But difficult though it is for us to imagine an interconnected cosmopolitan world before the invention of the internet, in fact, revolutionary ideas traveled back and forth across the Atlantic, starting in America and reaching four continents before 1800. Two centuries before the Arab Spring, without electronic social media or even an international postal system, ideas of liberty and equality in various languages inspired philanthropists transporting freed slaves to Sierra Leone, haunted governors of Caribbean colonies, informed novelists, and were proclaimed by revolutionary armies marching down the Italian peninsula. How? Well, that's where the Library of Congress comes in. Not, never fear, as a fomenter of these revolutionary currents, <laughs> but rather, and maybe more appropriately, as a preserver of the documents. In the 18th century, documents had legs. They traveled. Words traveled. They were no respecters of borders. And this goes from the obvious, pamphlets, newspapers, diplomatic decrees, the kind of documents we as political historians are accustomed to working with. But also, I've argued, from letters, novels, and even rumors, words were invested with the power of persuasion. Fortunately for historians, we have a paper trail to follow. And for me, as with all of my books, in fact, it began at the Library of Congress. I found letters sent home on packet ships by husbands and lovers who had been dispatched on diplomatic missions, pamphlets transported in pockets and annotated in margins by previous readers, Newspapers trans, um, reprinting accounts of clandestine meetings in Warsaw and Charleston. Diaries, some intended for publication and others not. 
and rumors that tell us more than the teller intended. And these are all at the center of my book. Not just the pamphlets that are available today to our students on the internet, who say, why go to a library? I can all find it online. But actually the manuscripts and rare books that require visiting the Library of Congress. Now most Americans know that Thomas Paine proclaimed, quote, tis time to part goading the Americans to battle for what he pictured as, quote, the free and independent states of America in July 1776. That common sense was filled with uncommonly frank language, charging, quote, there is something exceedingly ridiculous in the composition of a monarchy. But fewer of my amused students know that he cast the king as a worm. Or William the Conqueror was, in Paine's words, a French bastard landing with an armed banditti and establishing himself king of England against the consent of the natives in very plain terms a very paltry, rascally original. <laughs> Paine, who claims there is something very absurd in supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. But less well known is his line at the end of Common Sense. Quote, we have it in our power to begin the world again. In our modern age, when nation states reign supreme, we look to the 18th century for the roots of the nation states that have endured into the present. For the United States, France, and sometimes, and more recently, Haiti. That should probably be true for the Library of Congress, though that's an assumption that I want to question in the next half hour. If Thomas Paine or his contemporaries were thinking within national boundaries, why, I've asked, did they travel so widely? What did Paine mean by, we have it in our power to begin the world again? To answer that, I think we need to look beyond our borders, even in an age that founded our nation. And that's, to me at least, a much more compelling story in what Paine saw as a wide open rollicking world. So what I'm arguing is for readers of revolutionary history and for our students, including my students, what we've done is to reduce the rowdy world when revolutions seem to be erupting everywhere into the tidy American revolution of the founding fathers. And that isn't to reduce the sales of the biographies that are all down on the shelves of the bookshop downstairs. <laughs> and there is that section on founding fathers. Um, or even all of the books that aren't downstairs, but on the terror of the French revolutions. It's just that I don't think that's the way the contemporaries saw their world in the decades after America revolted in 1776. In our obsession with nation states of our own world, we forget that no inexorable logic led from an old regime of fragmented empires to a set of modern nations commanding the loyalty of geographically bound citizens. A Belgian pamphleteer proclaimed as his neighbor unfurled patriot flags over Utrecht, quote, over half of the globe, all men utter but one cry. They share but one desire. Humanity, united in action, after being oppressed for so long under tyranny, rises up with pride to reclaim a majestic and powerful liberty. Now these are the pamphlets that are in the American imprint collection in rare books, along with then the American responses, such as James Chalmers' Plain Truth, which are in the Oliver Walcott pamphlet collection. As reported in newspapers and recounted by entrepreneurial merchants from the Americas to Geneva, the Guinea Coast, and the Andes, revolutionaries challenged the rule of these tyrannical kings and overreaching nobles. The possibility of insurrection, depending on your perspective, either lurked or loomed on all of these areas, in plantations in the Caribbean islands, um, in novels written by about Dutch housewives, written actually by Dutch writers, um, raising their children on manuals inspired by John Locke, and among the um, and in West Africa, 
where these rebellions founded independent nation states they have that have endured, we celebrate them. The other struggles in Sierra Leone, Guadeloupe, Tuscany, and Geneva, equally hard fought, have been largely forgotten, consigned for the most part to the dustbin of history. I chanced on this topic as an undergraduate, not in, with Jim, not in the Library of Congress, but in the Public Records Office in London, now the National Archives in Kew. But then, and this was back in the 1970s when they removed the light bulbs to save um, electricity and what you really needed to do research was one of those miners hats with a light on the front. Um, I'd fill out my call slip, and then again, it was by hand, one of those lucky things we don't do anymore. So I'd filled out my call slip, and I have terrible handwriting, even though I'm the granddaughter of someone who taught penmanship. And so I got back the wrong folio. Well, in the time, of course, that it would take was raining, so I didn't bother to go outside and get a cup of tea. So in the time it took to get the ones that I really wanted to get, um, I thought, well, I've got this in front of me. What else am I going to do for the next hour? I might as well sit down and read it. And it, was, it said chicken farming on it. And I thought, oh, right, this is going to be real interesting. And as I started reading it, in the midst of all this were letters from Thomas Paine. They had been misfiled. They had just been stuck there. And I was, I was a senior. I was on a study abroad program working on a um, paper on London radicals. And what I discovered in this reading that I had not expected at all um, were the connections between Payne and the barristers that he was running into in London, but also Jacobins in Paris and finding connections with Germany. And suddenly I discovered all these interconnections that weren't in the secondary sources that I had read leading me up to write this, um, write this project. So I thought about it. And obviously, what do you do when you're an undergraduate? You're running up to the archivist saying, look what I found. And so um, here are the letters. And I think they're now properly, um, properly filed. And back in my mind, what I kept doing was filing away Payne's itinerant friends. And every time I would run into them over the last more than 30 years, I just sort of would put the note card aside or now would write it, write it on a um, file and kept it away. So I found them negotiating with Barbary pirates to free hostages, um, distributing shoes to French armies on behalf of the English radicals, spearheading the insurrection in Saint-Domingue with money that had been raised in London and Charleston, um, and sliding down bed sheets to escape a hanging in Dublin. I just kept filing these away um, as I wrote other books. But these characters were compelling. And what was really interesting to me were the connections that they made from one revolution to another. Let me just give you, and so these are the characters that are in, that are in my book. Um, there is a Tuscan merchant, Filippo Matsai, whose memoirs I found at used book stall in Aix-en-Provence. My husband does not like traveling where I can read the language because that's where you always find the great, the great books and you can also always then make it into the library. Um, he was Thomas Jefferson's Virginia neighbor who served as the Polish king's liaison in revolutionary Paris. Or Anna Falkenbridge, who's the wife of a British abolitionist who uh, founded Freetown in Sierra Leone and recounted her encounters among the Temne people. And there's Vincent Auger, who was frustrated by the laborious, equivocating French debates over slavery and so sailed back to Saint-Domingue to lead an insurrection, demanding rights for all people, quote, without regard to race. He was joined in his insurrection by veterans of the American Revolution. These were not founding fathers. They're not the, um, the subjects of the books on the shelves in the um, downstairs. Instead, these were people who were on the move. So the revolutionaries that I kept encountering in the archives, men and women, black and white, ignored borders. And what I also found was their international struggles for what they called universal rights, or universal, we would call universal human rights, do not fit neatly into national histories. So what I began to wonder was, as I was teaching French history, why do historians 
divide this revolutionary period into self-contained national stories. Why do we keep buying and selling biographies of founding fathers on this side of the Atlantic, or grisly accounts of the terror and its humane guillotine on the other? History doesn't repeat itself, even if Napoleon said it did, but as I've discovered, historians do. <laughs> Especially because our histories and our documents are organized or divided, is perhaps more apt, into national categories, with borders more rigid than those of the, of the revolutionaries, and certainly more divided than the revolutionaries discovered at the end of the 18th century. And again, these are the revolutionaries, some of whom we know quite well. Um, when Thomas Paine handed George Washington the key to the Bastille that had in, been entrusted to him by the Marquis de Lafayette, he reminded George Washington, this is October 1789, that, quote, a share in two revolutions is living to some purpose. And this is a theme that gets repeated over and over. There's a Dutch writer, Harry Pop, and he asked his wife, who he left behind, nice man, to tend to their family business, he took off. And he writes, what could be more enticing than to join revolutions that would humble aristocrats and dethrone kings? He set off disguised with a hat and a wig and two false passports and a sleep sack, and he found his way into four revolutions. Or there's the English poet, a lot of these people we know for other reasons, Helen Maria Williams, and she arrived in Paris on July 13th, 1790, the eve of the first celebration of the storming of the Bastille, and she woke up the first morning in revolutionary Paris to witness right out of her window the processions of men and women assembling on the Champ de Mars, led by Lafayette, including not only peasants from the provinces, but John Paul Jones, whose house is the John Paul Jones house is right down the street from where I live in Portsmouth, um, leading an American delegation, but also delegations from Geneva, from Poland, from Italy, from the United Provinces of the Netherlands, from Ireland, England, and Prussia. And at the center, of course, was Lafayette on his white um, charger. The press reported, quote, all national differences vanished all prejudices disappeared. Helen Maria Williams wrote home, how am I to paint the impetuous feeling of that immense, that exulting multitude? It was man reclaiming and establishing the most noble of his rights, and all it required was a simple sentiment of humanity to become in that moment a citizen of the world. And so you find these statements over and over again. Some we know well, Anasharsis Klutz, for example, who writes, the trumpet announcing the resurrection of a great people has sanded to the four corners of the earth. The cries of joy from a chorus of 25 million free men will awaken the peoples long asleep in, um, in slavery. So then our, my question, as I found these documents was, so how in the 18th century do ideas travel, um, again, before social media. Fifty years before the barricades of 1848, before Gavroche dies on the barricades of Les Mis in 1832, a century before the socialists founded the Second International. So I found the travelers that I had encountered, first of all, in meetings, in conversations, sometimes aboard ship, hammocks slung across the back deck of the appropriately named ship, the Sensible, with a young John Quincy Adams and the French diplomat Francois Barbet Marbois, who observed the keel hauling of a slave aboard a passing corsair. We find them talking in cafes and salons. The English poet Williams conversed with, we know, the French Jacobin Robespierre, the German chronicler Georg Forster, the Venezuelan general Miranda, the Polish revolutionary Kosciuszko, and others in her Paris apartment. How do we know that? Well, sometimes they leave us their journals or their memoirs, um, but we also have the reporting of spies. Um, intelligence agencies obviously weren't organized in the 20th century, and we have their records as well, including their records of 
reporting on other spies who were, they thought, the fomenters of the revolution, um, one of whom ended up finding his way into prison because there was no way not to expose the whole um, expedition. Or it's fun to read and to figure out what they're interpreting as the signal um, John Horn took sends out um, all these, what turned out to be dinner invitations, but um, let's assemble at 6 p.m. at, and then he gives an address. And of course, the spies, then you see through their records, took this as the assembly of, um, of ne'er-do-wells who were going to start the next revolution in England. Um, and you can only imagine what they felt like when they showed up. Um, we also can find in the pamphlets, and this is why you don't just find them online, but go look for them in, um, in rare books. Because in the, um, uh, in the margins, you find who had read them before, and you find comments as they get handed from one person to another. Um, encounters on the page transformed readers into revolutionaries. I suppose that's maybe not something you want to promote from the center of the book. Um, <laughs> But ideas did travel. And what's important then in the 18th century is this is a time when people took the written word seriously, which is wonderful for all of us um, who are historians. But I came to realize that what really pulled me in as a historian, and what all of you who work at the Library of Congress know, was that it was the documents themselves. And I think we historians, and it sometimes looks like what what we really are out to do is to, it's our conclusions that, that draw us in. But I think it's not. I think it's actually the documents. And it's actually holding the documents. And I came to realize that, John Vole, who's a former colleague, um, when I started taking students down, since I'm in New Hampshire, I obviously can't bring them to the Library of Congress. So I took um, a group of seniors to um, work in rare books at Harvard. And they had all been working on their papers. First of all, they were really excited because the librarian thought they were graduate students and then assumed, of course, they had come from a private institution. I could say, no, we're at the State University of New Hampshire. But what, but, and she was so impressed because these students had taken a Saturday. We all found a common day. We took the bus down. They had all been doing all the secondary research and what they could find of primary documents online. But what was so exciting was watching them actually get the letters and the journals that they had been reading about. And to realize, and they would come up and they'd say, but I think, doesn't this suggest, and then it would be a conclusion that was completely different than they had been reading. And you'd say, yeah, that, you know, that interpretation, Christina, makes a lot of sense. I couldn't get them out of the library. The bell rang. They did not want to leave. I've taken freshmen down to work in rare books um, at the Boston Public Library. And so here are students who have just started studying French. And they find there's a great um, collection of pamphlets from Saint-Domingue in, um, in Boston. So they would find pamphlets in French, and they could read them. And they would sit there opening these pamphlets. So it's not only, you know, first they get excited because it's actually a letter of Thomas Jefferson that they get to hold. But they find that here are the real documents that went into the writing of history. And I can tell you, when I can take students to do that, they become historians. I can take a class where they all came in as engineers and business students. But a few of them will overcome the skepticism of their parents and become historians. <laughs> so, so that's what I decided. That's how I, it's actually, it's my students that encourage me and that convinced me that the way to write a book was to write a book organized around the documents themselves. And so what I did in terms of organizing the, this book is the, as I was telling John, the complex organization that about did me in is that each chapter looks at it, how we read a different kind of document. So that in addition, it of course starts out with pamphlets and um, Thomas Paine. But I'm also looking at the novels written by these Dutch novelists. Um, looking at how do we read rumors? What do we do when we read what some of other historians have called reading against the grain? So it's using the documents themselves. Because I think that's what's exciting to all of us is to return, and you all know this, it's to return to the, um, 
to those documents. Now, not all of these documents were, some of them are obvious, but not all of them are easy to find. And let me just give you um, one, um, one example from lots of, this is from lots of examples from emails that I've sent out that were generously answered by archivists and librarians, um, not to mention all the visits to municipal archives and national libraries. And these, so these are the letters of um, one of my characters. Not all my characters moved. Some were sort of the tel telegraph poles that stayed still that um, transmitted messages. And one of those is Nancy Shippen. Um, who uh, lived in Philadelphia. She was the daughter of the Continental Army's Surgeon General. And she, um, she was courted by the French um, attache, Louis Otto. And those, those documents, those letters are excerpted and they were published um, a century ago by Ethel Arms, who had found a chest of documents when restoring the Stratford Hall in Virginia. And she realized that most of the correspondence had been classified by the Shippens and cataloged in letter books deposited in the Division of Manuscripts at, obviously, the Library of Congress, which I then read um, mostly on microfilm here. From this correspondence, we learn in great detail, probably more than ever they wanted us to know, about the courtship of Louis Otto and Nancy Shippen. And let me just read you one quick example of this why we love these documents. So Otto took to walking past the uh, Shippen's elegant three-story red brick uh, Georgian house on 4th Street every day. Nancy suggested a rendezvous with him at the corner of her garden, but guided by his French manners and concern for her reputation, he rejected what he writes as your contrivance of the corner. What's interesting to me is he's complaining all along of his struggle to write in English, quote, a language that is not my own. But he seems to have no difficulty expressing his sentiments. He asked Shippen to read his true feelings, quote, and these are the letters that are um, downstairs, in my eyes, in my whole conduct, or if it is possible, read them in your heart. Um, he leaves her house and he rhapsodizes in what I think is fluent English. Quote, your image is entirely present to me. All my thoughts are so entirely directed towards you that I see or feel nothing in the world but you. So we have this whole collection of letters. Um, and, but in the end, Shippen is um, courted also by Henry Livingston, who's presumably the most um, eligible bachelor um, in the United States at the time. He's a military veteran from a very well-connected family. Nancy chose him. Otto was devastated um, and writes saying, how could this possibly happen? I thought, you know, that your parent, you and your parents had allowed me to visit you every day. That meant that everything was going along and he's, she gets married the next day. Her father won't even let him see her because he's sure that this will um, turn Nancy back to Otto. Well, Nancy and Henry did not live happily ever after. Based on her letters home, which are, again, downstairs, to her parents and her brother um, from her new home on the Hudson. And let me just read you a bit of that. So um, there are two years of disguised references and whispers and Nancy Ship and Livingston learned from her mother-in-law of Livingston's plans to install his illegitimate children, of whom there were apparently many, in their household to be raised alongside their daughter. If her husband, a known rake, fit the bill of an estated ruffian of a Henry Fielding novel, then it followed in her mind that she was, quote, the virtuous female in distress, the wronged wife. Although she ached after her daughter, she ended up going to her mother and having to leave her daughter with her um, mother-in-law. Nancy Ship and Livingston was so convinced that her husband would make her miserable at home um, with his taunts of infide infidelity that she chose to endure solitude in Philadelphia. So again, we've got the letters between Nancy Shippen and her, um, and her mother-in-law. It's really in keeping with the novels that were in the earlier, the chapter just before that by Wollstonecraft and de Charrière. And Wollstonecraft's novels are not things you want to read on rainy days in Brussels. They were, 
Um, and in fact, like Nancy Shippen, um, all the characters end up going crazy and dying prematurely. And that is indeed what happens to Nancy. Not so Otto. So I learned from a chance reference in some diplomatic papers in the Archive des, des Affaires étrangères that was in in Paris um, that I was reading for the last chapter on diplomatic correspondence um, that Otto married the amazingly named daughter of the famous writer St. John de Crèvecoeur. Her name is America Frances de Crèvecoeur. She was known as Fanny, and Thomas Jefferson was their principal reference. Her story is pretty amazing, um, and you could piece it together from her father's papers, also at the Library of Congress, um, which had been exchanged with the Bibliothèque Nationale for some Jefferson documents. So what, what we do know is, this is from de Crèvecourt's writing, um, quote, cruel death had taken their mother. Um, the misfortunes of war had driven their father to Europe. The flames of savages had reduced their paternal house to cinders. The subsistence that he had left them was destroyed. And then this fellows, who's a, um, the father of two people, two boys that he rescues, came to their aid. He took them under his roof and placed them among his own, all because five Americans had escaped their imprisonment in England. Four feet of snow prevented Crevcourt's immediate departure for Boston when he finds out that that's where his daughter is. But the evening that he arrives, the Crevcourt family is now together again at the fellow's household in Boston. Um, and Crevcourt adds for the benefit of its European um, readers, quote, to this image of domestic happiness. He describes them dancing with violins playing. Um, to this image, he says, must be joined those of order, of economy, of cleanliness, and of industry. Didn't you know that's what all American households look like? Um, and he adds, quote, this happiness was to be found in almost every American household. What a contrast then to the salon-centered society that he describes. So that set me on what turned out to be a four-year long search. Because what I wanted to find was, I knew that Otto then ends up in France. He, right after, um, and after St. John de Crèvecoeur is over there, that he ends up in Berlin, and that there are long periods of time where he's um, separated from Fanny. But I could find no letters. Um, they just, she just like disappears without a trace. And so of course there's part of the problem is how do you trace someone who is maybe America Francis de Crèvecoeur, maybe America Francis de Saint-Jean, maybe America Francis Otto, maybe Fanny Otto, maybe Mrs. Lewis Otto, all of these um, attempts. But, um, and Lewis Otto's papers are very clearly carefully cataloged, the diplomatic ones and preserved in Paris. So I found various, you know, those tantalizing hints. For example, the family of a Boston merchant um, had rescued her for, as, a, as a child from the snowdrifts, and they had written their memoirs. It's a funny little book called Fanny St. John, A Romantic Incident of the American Revolution. Um, and then in a familiar story to all of those of us who work with manuscripts, they had been loaned to a friend the letters and gone missing. Did they ever exist? Did they go missing? What happened to them? We don't know, but I didn't find them. Um, we find great nephews who had papers that um, he supposedly loaned to various people writing histories of the letters from an American farmer. Um, I knew they had been written, but nobody could find them. And the break came in 2009 when Barbara Baer, um, then acting early American specialist in the manuscript division, here found notes indicating that the Crevcore papers had been for sale in 1976. This was just like, I couldn't believe it. It's like, yes, you know, you look for these forever. Um, but unfortunately, they were offered at such an exorbitant price that neither the French nor the Americans, meaning here the Library of Congress, could afford them. So the letters were auctioned individually. Um, and widely dispersed on the autograph market. Um, but I have to say that Barbara Bear was dogged on my behalf, um, and her notes tracing the family papers are invaluable. 
The Library of Congress has an, is an amazing resource for those of us who are doing historical research. Um, at the other end of how to do historical research is what we tell our students not to do. You know, when you get bored, one of those random Google searches. It, I did find, I hit the right, the right combination of phrases, that the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs had um, recently acquired some of the letters. As soon as I found that, I rushed and wrote my email in all my best French to say, could I please look at them? And they were moving out of Paris, so they were closed for a year and a half. So I patiently waited for a year and a half, and the last week of my term in December, a year and a half later, in the rain, I showed up at the doors of the um, archive. Yes, I can finally look at them. I'd written to say I was coming, of course. And they said, oh, yes. They were almost warm and welcoming me. Here, we will take you up to read the microfilms. And I said, the what? <laughs> the microfilms. And I said, no. And I, luckily, I could convince them that I needed to see how the letters were put together. And we all have our ploys, right? How, what, to see the envelope, the, how they were folded. And so they actually did then let me see the originals and work with the originals. And it really was worth all of that wait. Because in that, I could actually see then who this woman was. And it showed me a lot about this relationship that had gone from America to France. And the couple that was said to be the model of an American household in Europe, first in, in revolutionary Paris um, and then in Berlin. So I did come to know them. And I think maybe it's one of those things where it becomes all that much more important because you've spent so long um, looking for it. Um, so those are the kind of documents that are at the center of the um, book. And what I've tried to do also is to talk about how we find our documents, not only how we, um, how we read them. So it's these documents that reveal what I see as an alternative political sphere. So it's not only that it's crossing borders, and, but it's that it's not founding fathers. That is, this is a time when we really need to expand our definition of what we mean by political. Because it's the time when um, Marat talks about the um, removing of the blindfold, um, when everyone does become involved in um, discussions of, um, of politics. From the, um, the people who brought me there in the first place, the um, merchants, and the small tradesmen in London who had put a penny in the, um, in the cup um, after smoking their pipes after dinner and gathered to discuss um, the politics in London of the, um, of the French Revolution. And because they cross borders, these are also the people who will call into question what the compromises that seem so um, obvious to founding fathers who stayed at home. So it's the ones who call into question, whose ideas, sometimes they seem like Don Quixote's ideas. And other times now, they seem so commonplace. Um, when someone, when the Yale graduate Abraham Bishop returns, for example, from France, and he's back, and he can't believe when he hears that um, under Thomas Jefferson, that we're opposing the freeing of slaves in Saint-Domingue, that the US could possibly um, be standing against freedom. And so that's what, those are the kind of documents that I want, that I wanted to find. So my art, my book is then really also an argument for cosmopolitanism. It's a challenge to nationalism as our only modern political um, story. And it's arguing against, I think, the historians who have a lot at stake in perpetuating their view of a revolutionary world as the founding of the founding fathers who are defending claims of nationalism. And I think these historians are sometimes as virulent as saber rattlers on the stage of foreign policy. So my argument is that history restricted then to founding fathers, as was said in the introduction, that that history limits the way we understand our own world. That we need to instead study the history of dead ends, we need to understand history of revolutions that fizzled out. Because otherwise, I think we assume that revolutionary movements against autocratic regimes of our own day will eventually 
with just a little assistance following the steps of George Washington or Robespierre. I think then we're baffled by uncertain outcomes of uprisings in Tunisia and Libya. We're surprised by Egyptians or Syrians who like the 18th century revolutionaries in Cap Francais or Geneva or Freetown, borrowed their ideas of citizenship from disparate sources, sometimes from their neighbors, oftentimes from legends of their own past. So what I'm suggesting is we can't just look for liberal democracy in every upheaval from Romania to Egypt, because if we do, we'll inevitably be frustrated by what we find. Revolutionaries who challenge dictators will not necessarily turn out to be liberals, nor will their struggle follow a path any of us had expected based on what we know from our national history as we tell it. So as a historian, I'm boldly suggesting that understanding flows in both directions, from the past to the present and from the present to our understanding of the past. To forget the messiness of the past is to be condemned to judge the present limited by the blinders of a small set of national narratives. And my friend John Bull um, from the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding suggested as I was finishing the book that like the 18th century revolutionaries who ventured beyond borders, in John's words, quote, Muslim militants are working to create non-national revolutionary narratives and many of our policymakers have difficulty in understanding that. Revolutionaries from out of the way places who struggled against unbeatable odds 200 years ago have much to say to readers living in a world where revolutions of all sizes had varied, unpredicted, and interconnected outcomes. I'm suggesting that we ignore them at our peril. Thank you. Some questions. Yes. Have you, as you're doing research for your various books, do you find that you have something that you're looking for, and so you go to an institution possibly outside the country, or is it that you know that certain institutions might have interesting stuff, and you go to those institutions to see what you might find? Probably Somebody good. Oh, so when I, when I go to a different um, library, um, do I go looking for certain um, documents, or do I go because I know they might be an interesting repository that would, have, that would house documents that might prove of interest? Is that? And I'd say it's both. Um, usually I go because I know they have a certain document, a certain set of letters. Um, I've, I know from looking through catalogs that they have a certain set of pamphlets, for example. But while I'm there, I never stop at that. I mean, it's, you'd always have to give yourself time to see what you will just chance upon by serendipity, as I did when I started out by finding those letters by Thomas Paine. Now, not usually because I've ordered the wrong folio, but um, you know, you'll look through, um, in the old days, you know, looking through the cards to see what they have. It's, it's often by talking with librarians and archivists to find out what's there as well. Um, now I was working on a biography of a um, study of the founding of social democracy um, in, um, at the end of the 19th century. And I was working in, in the archives of the Socialist Party in um, Belgium. And the archives is in Brussels. And, she said, oh, you might be interested in these boxes. You know, we didn't have any place to put them. I mean, and this is, we all have these stories, you know. We didn't have any place to put them. And you're in luck because they're in the women's restroom. And there they were. You know, there was this pile of boxes. And there were this, this whole great set of correspondence that no one had yet had time or the funding to, um, again, that's a major issue, to catalog. So I think it's both, but that's a great question. Thanks. Yes, please. It strikes me that at least among the American revolutionaries, which is the group that I'm most familiar with, there were some who definitely identified with a international revolutionary impulse. Mm -hmm. And there were others who very much did not. And of course, as you know, pain in part because of his rejection of traditional Christianity 
was close to being a pariah by the time he came back to the U.S. in the early, at the very beginning of the 19th century. Right, and yeah, and I think what's interesting too is if you look at over time, I mean, it's the 1790s where you really find the sort of strident, we aren't French, we're Americans, and you find, um, you find that rhetoric, um, the national rhetoric, um, I think, that, that becomes um, distinguished from everything else that's outside there, whether it's the Caribbean, which is even more frightening than, um, than France. And I do tell my students that if they think political rhetoric is charged now, they should read the accounts of Thomas Paine trying to come back to the um, to American shores when he wants to come back. There are these great newspaper accounts of Paine being caged in France um, with the animals in a zoo um, and being fed, you know, handouts and yeah. I mean, Paine is well because he'd taken on George Washington, saying why you know Paine almost went to the guillotine. And he appealed to George Washington to help him get out. Payne's cellmate, Klutz, did go to the guillotine. Payne was too sick, so actually just barely escaped. But Washington wouldn't help him at all. So he wrote, a, he wrote an open letter um, attacking George Washington. So if you're faced with who do we side with, George Washington, Thomas Payne, guess who won? George Washington. And so then Thomas Payne comes across. Yeah, it's, part of it is his religion. And part of it also is that he had dared to take on national institutions. And he doesn't find the revolution going the way he wants to. So he ends up being denied the vote, which is, I think, one of those really telling stories. So yes, and I, I guess the other, the, um, the other answer to your question about um, the nationalism is that as these revolutions develop, that's where I do see the nationalism come. And so to say there's cosmopolitanism is not to say there's not nationalism. I think it's, I mean, I think um, Kant defines cosmopolitanism in this period precisely because it is a period where nationalism has its roots as well. So that's an important point. Other questions? You yes? You were looking at documents in French and English. Did you use other languages or primarily French and English? Yeah, so what languages were my documents in? Um, the ones I could read were in um, French and English, yes, and Dutch and Spanish and some German, um, some Latin, actually, some of the Belgian pamphlets. When I got to Polish, I ran into trouble. Um, but I happened to be at a conference in Budapest um, where they needed someone to represent that. It was on, um, for Central Europeans, this was a few years ago, looking at roots of liberal democracy in, um, in Western Europe, who were arguing could nationalism and liberalism work together. And to find that, they went back and looked at the 19th century. But they couldn't find someone to represent both halves of Belgium. So they asked me to do it, which was really exciting. That was, that was great fun. Um, but there, so I had colleagues who were there who were native Polish speakers, and so I've called on their, on their skills. But language is something that, I mean, that's one of those things that I keep telling my students. You need languages. John Bull has made a career of telling our students that as well, that they really, those languages are absolutely, um, are absolutely essential. So yeah, I did, I did have to read in, in other languages as well. But now it's going to be just as bad with our students who can't read, um, can't read cursive. So I can't write comments on my papers anymore. I have to hand write, I mean, I have to print them. And I think, how are they going to read, how are they going to come down to manuscripts and read the documents? That will be a really interesting issue. So yeah. Were the, the, uh, was the handwriting by Americans, I, I would like to think, better back then than it is today? Yeah, it's more regular, so that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. Um, but it, you know, it, obviously it's different from one country to another as well, and from one culture to another, so. You just, you get used to it, I mean, that's, you forget, and, and you forget how hard it is. I was just um, working on a legal case, actually, in my neighborhood where we had some documents in 19, from 1913 that had been 
written. And I was so excited. I scanned them. I sent them off to the lawyer and said, look, and I found the documents that describe the garden that went with the house. And he said, well, I can't read these. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, to me, they were just like, they were as clear as, you know, typing, but they couldn't. You obviously are pointing out with UI way to a real educational niche opportunity for somebody to teach a, a new language called the way we used to write. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> My grandmother would have taught that. <laughs> um, I, I, I must apologize. I sort of advanced my question because I don't want to take away from the subject matter you're, you're more specifically discussing in your book, which um, definitely get a copy of that. It's a wonderful book and a greatly fascinating presentation. But I was also struck during it by the fact that it seems like we might be living in, a, in an age of international non-nation state based cultural revolution. I refer to the to Middle East and to Islam and to its role in the ferment with its relationship to the West. Almost like Marx again or like I mean and the question I have for you is and possibly to the gentleman there is, to John, yes. Is, is, is um, where might one go to be informed about um, about the kinds of interconnections and the kinds of, um, of, of elements in, in thinking that are going to have to be synthesized or they're attempting to be synthesized or that not being very well synthesized um, now. In so, this, yes. In this, in this era. So where do we go to understand um, a world that crosses borders in, um, in, this in this particular age when we think so much within national borders? And we think that the way to solve things is to fortify well, national borders. Somehow maybe there's some, some answers, some useful pieces of information there. I'm wondering where, where, what you're aware of in terms of the type of work that's being done in that. That's well, I, I will defer to John on that because I think one of those interesting things about how do you go from history to understanding our world is more that what history teaches us is not to expect what we expect and to always be prepared for something completely different. And the fact that we do have learned to understand the past in our own way does give us those skills, to, I think, to understand what we see around us, but it's never what we've seen before. And John, would you like to add to that, please? Yeah, well, just uh, stand. In, terms of, stand? in terms of contemporary, um, I think there is, to me, there's an 18th century model that's slightly different, that comes, comes out of the scientific revolution. And there was an old phrase called the invisible college, which were, which were people who had interconnections that, 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 that Janet is talking about. And now the difference is that the informal gossip and rumor stuff can now be available on the internet. But as I like to tell my graduate students in particular, I say if your name is Ahmed or Muhammad or something like that, don't spend too much time on the internet looking at the uh, Islamic State uh, uh, website because Homeland Security might come and visit you. <laughs> but uh, the, it's now, it's, it's scattered. The, the difference is that there isn't yet a full Library of Congress collection uh, that I can go to for the contemporary Islamic State stuff. But it's, the process is still the same. Mm -hmm. Or other. All right. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Janet, in particular. You know, it was a, <clears throat> you know, your book is wonderful, and you're also a terrific speaker, giving us your enthusiasm and also your knowledge and uh, your own conclusions, uh, which are also in the book. But it was great to hear you in person and to have a chance to host you at the Library of Congress. Uh, I forgot two items that are out there. We also would love to have you fill out, if you have a chance, after you buy the book and are waiting for the autograph, uh, the event survey. And uh, we also have a list of our future talks uh, that I see needed replenishing, but I'll bring it back down for the signing uh, air time while you're filling out the form. But let's uh, give Janet one more round of applause for a wonderful book and a wonderful performance. Thank you very much.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.